the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Geismar Katz, and I'm director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y. I am so pleased to welcome you here tonight for the first of our three commemorative lectures for the year. These particular lectures have all been endowed by family members in honor and or memory of the ideals and interests of their loved ones. No one can speak more eloquently about the man we honor this evening or about our speaker than the woman I will introduce to you in a moment. But let me tell you a little bit about the two other commemorative lectures that we will be presenting in the spring. On February 9th, the noted pediatrician and child psychiatrist, Dr. T. Barry Brazelton, will be delivering the Rothschild Lecture. And on May 1st, Dr. Henry Kissinger will present the Rosenthal Lecture. Hi, John. <laughs> the Rosenthals are in our audience this evening. Just a few other evenings you, wish, you may wish to attend. On November 2nd, Margaret Thatcher will be here in conversation with Tom Brokaw. On November 14th, Neil Simon will be interviewed by Wendy Wasserstein. That will not be here at, on, on our stage. That will be on the west side at Congregation Road of Shalom. Our foreign policy series, which began, for those of you who he, were here the other night, you know we had quite an evening with Senator Sam Nunn. Uh, and we will continue, hopefully a little bit quieter and easier, with um, Terry Anderson, Helen Sussman, and in January, McGeorge Bundy will speak on nuclear proliferation. We have a wonderful new series with choreographers, where Deborah Jowett uh, from the Village Voice will be speaking with Eric Hawkins, with Judith Jameson, and with Merce Cunningham. We're very, very pleased about that series. And finally, this year, Jeff Greenfield's series will focus on the changing face of the media with the people who have the power to do all the changing they want. The head of CBS, Howard Stringer. The head of the Daily News, Mort Zuckerman. The head of HBO, Michael Fuchs. And then Jeff and Jerry Della Femina will, will sort of wrap it all up on the very last evening. And as you know, this is only a part. So we hope that we will be seeing you very often this year. One piece of business about this evening, after the lecture is over and after the, the questions are answered, um, our speaker will be, well, we will be selling books, our speaker will be signing his books back in the Hall of Mirrors. Usually we go into the art gallery, but this evening right back behind the, uh, the concert hall. Okay. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to a wonderful woman with whom I've had the privilege working when she was a member of the board of this great institution. There is much to say about her, but she always reminds me that this evening is about her father. And no one can convey him to you better than she can. Lazi ladies and gentlemen, Nikki Newman Tanner. Good evening. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Howard Gardner, who will give this evening the fifth Albert Hardy Newman lecture. When my father, Albert Newman, died, our family determined that a lectureship on subjects that would have interested him, given by men and women he would have enjoyed meeting and listening to, would be the most appropriate kind of memorial. He would certainly have been interested in Howard Gardner, actually each of the Howard Gardners, since it's hard to believe that this number of involvements and achievements are those of only one man. Dr. Gardner was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to German Jewish refugees, was a gifted pianist as a child, and turned to writing in high school, working on the school newspaper. In 1961, he entered Harvard, earning a BA in 1965 and a PhD in developmental psychology in 1971. Gardner has spent much of his adult life trying to improve the quality of education in this country and has received for his efforts numerous awards, among them a MacArthur Prize Fellowship in 1981 
and the University of Louisville Graumeyer Award in Education in 1990. In addition to his teaching responsibilities at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, he is the co-director of Harvard's Project Zero, a nationally renowned research organization with which he has been involved since its beginning in 1967. He is consulting psychologist at the Boston Veterans Administration Medical Center, adjunct professor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, and in his spare time, he has written 14 books. Of these, his best known, Frames of Mind, was published in 1983. It is in this book, recently published in its 10th anniversary edition, that Gardner sets forth his theory of multiple intelligences, according to which there are separate mental capacities or intelligences ranging from musical intelligence to the intelligence involved in self-understanding that are relatively independent of one another and that individuals may possess each to varying degrees. The MI theory, as it is familiarly known, confronts this country's prevailing one-dimensional view of how to assess intelligence and how to teach our children. Think about the sailors in the South Seas, Gardner urges, who find their way around thousands of islands by looking at the stars. Intelligence in that sailor society would refer to their navigational ability. Think of surgeons and engineers, hunters and fishermen, dancers and choreographers, athletes and athletic coaches, tribal chiefs and sorcerers. In his most recent book, Creating Minds, he helps us to do just that by using his seven intelligences as starting points to examine seven extraordinary individuals, Freud, Einstein, Picasso, Stravinsky, Eliot, Graham, and Gandhi, each an outstanding example of one kind of intelligence. My father would have recognized, as we all must, the relationship between our survival on this planet and our ability to mobilize the full range of human intelligences. And he would have looked forward, just as we do, to hearing from Dr. Howard Gardner. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Can you all hear me? No. They, they were having a little mic trouble, so I said I would make sure that I didn't begin for real until I was audible. Is this better? Okay, good. Well, let, let, us, let us know if it's not. I'm very, very pleased to appear on this podium, and I was actually humbled when I heard the names of all the other people who are going to be appearing in the next months. And as you know, I'm studying creativity, and in listening to the list, I realized I'd actually have fuel for several more books if I just came to all the lectures here. So I envy you those of you who live closer to the 92nd Street Y than do I. I'm going to talk tonight about my work in creativity. And since we've come to the end of the 20th century, I thought it would be good to begin by thinking about the people who have, in a sense, framed our era, the people whose ideas and whose demonstrations have really been important for the, the modern era. And I brought along slides of them You've already heard their names. I thought it would be fun for you to see what they looked like, not when they became old and famous, but rather when they were having their, their ideas. So let's see if we can have the first slide. This is the man who changed our understanding of the physical world. This is Albert Einstein when he was uh, um, just, just out of the university as a young man. That's Pablo Picasso as a visual artist when he was in his early 20s, just before he launched the Cubist Revolution, which changed the way we depict and think about the, the graphic world. This is the youthful Igor Stravinsky, whose contributions in the area of music very much parallel those of Picasso in the visual arts. T.S. Eliot his graduating, graduation picture from Harvard, um, his poetry, I think more than any other 
work really defined the, the tempo of, of, of this century, and particularly the wasteland of, of 1923. This is a fairly easy one to, uh, to recognize. Of course, Martha Graham, who I think more than any other figure of the century really gave us our, our, the, the, the dance of our time. As the legend says, this is Gandhi, who to my way of thinking is the individual whose political dash religious ideas not only were the most important of the century, but may well be the most important of the millennium. Finally, I am a psychologist, so I had to include at least one psychologist in the, in the list, and this is, of course, Freud, but it's before he became Freud. This is when he was still Sigmund, and was, uh, <laughs> uh, or, or Siggy, as his mother always called him. Now, I've just shown you seven people and the question I'm now going to say is, which of those is the most creative? Was Freud the most creative? Was Graham? Was Gandhi? Who was more creative, Einstein or Stravinsky? Picasso or Gandhi? Now, I hope you'll agree that, that those are bad questions, because you can't really compare one kind of creativity with another, in my view, because people who are creative in different domains or crafts or disciplines do things that are so different from one another that it's like comparing apples and oranges. It is in trying to understand the similarities and the differences among these kinds of creativity that I was inspired to write a book called Creating Minds, which appeared a few months ago. And my plan tonight is in the next 45 minutes to tell you something about the ideas in Creating Minds. And then thereafter, we'll turn on the lights and I'll be happy to um, I think Nikki said, answer questions. I'll be happy to hear questions. We'll have to see whether I can answer them or not. I'll, I'll do my best. The talk is in five parts. I wanted to give my own theoretical background, but I thought to be fair, I should also tell you what other people have thought about creativity. So I've decided to devote five minutes to my own background and five minutes to what we used to call in college, all previous thought. <laughs> and we'll, be, we'll begin with all previous thought. Then I'm going to talk some about the background to the particular study that I carried out of these seven individuals, spend the bulk of my time on the principal findings of the book, and in the end, um, as a reward for listening to the rest of the lecture, I'm going to answer the two questions which are doubtless on your minds. The first one is, how to become creative? And the second one is, are you creative? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the money back guarantee if you, uh, if you endure for the next 45 minutes. Traditionally in psychology, there have been two primary views of creativity. And if you were to look creativity up in a textbook, the bulk of the references, if there were any, would be to two fields. One is called psychometrics. That actually means the study of human ability through giving tests. And all of you know anything about IQ tests or intelligence will know that one of the great achievements of psychology this century has been to test how smart people are by giving them short answer tests. I have a lot of things to say about IQ tests, most of them negative, but I'm not going to um, do that tonight. Let me simply say that if you don't like intelligence tests, you'll hate creativity tests because they're really quite banal. The, uh, um, in fact, they sort, of, they sort of invert the whole idea. The, the prototypical item on a creativity test is how many uses can you come up with for a paperclip? And if you're good at doing that, then psychologists will say that you are creative. Now, what's interesting about the psychometric approach is that it's highly reliable. What that means in technical terms is if you give people creativity tests over and over again, they'll always do about the same. If their CQ is 120, it'll continue being 120. But what doesn't work out about creativity tests and the reasons why they're much less known than intelligence tests is because they aren't valid. And the technical definition of valid means that if people do well in creativity tests, it doesn't mean they're really going to do anything that anybody would care about. And that single flaw is, I fear, fatal, and that's all I'm going to say about <laughs> psychometrics. Um, the other thing which is in the textbooks, and something which most of us, including me, will probably be somewhat fonder of, is what we might call the psychody psychodynamic approach. It's an approach which really grows out of Freud. And the view here is not to think too much about the mind, the thought processes, um, 
the problem-solving capacities of creative individuals, but rather about their motivation and about their personality. And those of you who've read Freud and other psychoanalysts on creativity will know that there's a lot of talk about um, unconscious motivation, about sexual themes in the, in the ideas of creative people, and about the kinds of neuroses and defense mechanisms which you often find in creative individuals. And many people, including me, have learned from this point of view, but one of the major problems with it is, unfortunately, it doesn't discriminate between people who are creative and people who are just nutty or hung up. And uh, uh, Freud himself agreed and said in front of the problem of the creative individual, psychoanalysis must lay down its arms. And uh, perhaps it has. More recently, and I think somewhat more promisingly, is the approach in psychology called the cognitive approach. This is an approach which focuses very much on the mental operations and mental, op and mental representations that individuals are supposed to use when they are thinking and problem solving. And uh, you may not all know the term um, cognitive or cognitive science, but it's associated with people like Noam Chomsky, the linguist, Piaget, the uh, child psychologist, developmental psychologist, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winning computer scientist, one of the people who invented artificial intelligence. And I picked as a more contemporary figure my own, because I had this photograph among other things, my colleague David Perkins at Harvard Project Zero, who is a major student of creativity from the cognitive point of view. By and large, cognitivists are interested in problem solving, though some of them are also interested in problem finding, which I think is a much more interesting question. By and large, they say of creative individuals that they use the same processes as everybody else. There's no special creative operation. There's no special creative mind. But maybe creative people are simply more expert, or they know more moves that one can make. And uh, this is, I think, a way of getting into the, some of the operations that creative people enter into when they're solving a problem. But I always feel that the things that's, that are distinctive about the kinds of people who I'm interested in, the Freuds, the Grahams, and so on, is not really very well explained by the cognitive approach. Still more recently, and I fear this is the end of all previous thought, is the work of two colleagues who have inspired me quite directly. One of them is a man who lives in New York named Howard Gruber, who began some decades ago doing very intensive case studies of highly creative individuals. He worked particularly on Darwin and studies Darwin's thought processes as they unfolded virtually on a day-to-day -day basis at the time when Darwin was developing the principal ideas of the theory of evolution, natural selection. And that kind of intensive case studies where you really get inside the, the mind brain of the creator and trying to figure out what he or she is doing on virtually an hourly basis is I think a very promising approach. There's another approach which is almost the exact opposite. Gruber's approach is called in the trade ideographic. Ideographic means that you focus very much on the individual, the idiosyncratic person, and try to understand him or her as deeply as possible. The completely opposite approach is called nomothetic, from the Greek for law, nomos, regularity. And what nomotheticists do is the exact opposite. Instead of doing intensive case studies, they come up with a question, and they try to figure out the way in which they can get the most data on the most people in the most efficient way, and then they quantify. So if, for example, Dean Simonton, who I think is the best practitioner of the nomothetic approach, is interested in the question of, do more creative people do their best work in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, he will simply get an encyclopedia and find out how many lines are devoted to people's work in each of those decades. He'll get thousands of points of data, he'll feed it to the computer, and he will tell you the answer. And the answers are often quite interesting. The goal of the approach that I've developed, which doesn't really have a name yet, is to build a bridge, build a bridge between the ideographic and the nomothetic approach. More specifically, to begin with case studies of individuals, such as the seven people whom I studied for this project, and to see which kinds of laws and regularities might emerge. Now, of course, you can't come up with many for seven, and the eighth person is always likely to get you because uh, that person doesn't fit into the generalization. But if you have developed a method for studying creative people, as I would like to think that I have done, and you use the same methods to study them, you can eventually figure out what laws may 
actually regulate creative behavior of all people or of all the people who work in a domain or maybe of all the people who work in a domain in a certain historical era, as well as those things which really do seem to be ideographic. There are probably some things about Darwin, some things about Picasso, which just apply to them. Anyway, thank you for your indulgence as I've spoke about our previous thought. Let me move now to the work which I've undertaken with a few close colleagues. The people who I want to cite, though I could cite others, are psychologist David Feldman, colleague at Tufts University in Boston, and the easy name to pronounce, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who is a colleague at the University of Chicago. And working together with them, though I'm not going to blame them for any of my conclusions, we've come up with a way of thinking about creativity, which we believe might be better than that of our predecessors. The definition that I use for a creative individual is that it's a person who regularly solves problems or fashions products or asks new questions in a domain in a way which is initially novel but eventually is acceptable in at least one culture. This definition needs to be unpacked. Solving a problem is not controversial, but fashioning a product, making something, composing a symphony, um, devising a new form of resistance the way Gandhi did, is iconoclastic within psychology because there's no way that you can assess that in a few minutes by asking people whether they can give you the uses for a paperclip. It takes time. And so I think we need to, def to define creative individuals in terms of the things that they can actually do and not in terms of some potential which may or may not be achieved. So creative individuals solve problems in fashion products and they do it regularly. There are no flashes in the pan unless they have the misfortune of dying when they're 18 or 20 and they just don't have time to do anything else. But creative people, it's a way of being. It's something they do regularly. And that's a very important part of the way that I think about this. Moreover, people are creative in a domain. They are creative in painting or in history or in running organizations or in entrepreneurship. And there is just no way, there's no reason to think that because a person is creative in one domain, because Mar Mozart says is incredibly creative in music, that that person would be creative in other domains as well. In fact, I would argue, consistent with my theory of multiple intelligences, that creativity is probably rather domain-specific. So you can already see how I'm beginning to poke at the, at the definitions which uh, I ran by quickly before. Finally, you might think the last part of the definition is less problematic, but it's not. Everybody agrees that to do something creative, initially it has to be novel. But the last part of the definition is, uh, is tantalizingly complex because it argues that, that something is creative only if people who are knowledgeable think it's creative. And we use the term field for that. There has to be a field of individuals who know something or who can be trained to know something who decide whether something is creative or not. Now, why should this be problematic? Well, it's because of what I call the dipstick theory of creativity which is if you stuck a dipstick in somebody's head and pulled it out and you stuck it in the right place, you could see how creative that person is. According to my definition, that's wrong. The only way you can decide whether somebody is creative is if other people decide that he or she is. The saving grace is the decision doesn't have to be made right away. People like um, em em um, Emily Dickinson or Gregor Mendel or Vincent van Gogh died in obscurity. That's not a town in France. Um, and uh, it's not a joke either. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, people decided that they were creative, and that's why we're interested in them. And sometimes the opposite happens. There are many people who got lots of lines in the encyclopedia in 1900, and they're forgotten nowadays. And that means that longer view has said that they aren't considered to be very creative. So that's a definition which I would like you to hold on to. Moreover, we argue that to understand creativity, you have to pay attention to a number of different levels of analysis, to different disciplines, if you will. Part of understanding creativity is to understand something about the brain, the biology, the genetics of creative individuals. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but you could ask me about it later if you want. Um, the second part, and the part that most people think of, is basically the psychological approach. What do we know about the thinking, the cognition of creative individuals, and what do we know about their personalities, the kinds of folks that they are? But Feldman, Csikszentmihalyi, and I argue that you have to pay attention to two other 
features. One is the, the domain of knowledge. I call that the impersonal, the actual area of thought or of practice, because you can be creative in an area of practice as well as an area of thought in which a person makes a contribution. And finally, what I mentioned before, the multipersonal element, the field, the judgments that are made by other people of the work of that person. You have to pay attention, in other words, to biology, psychology, epistemology, if you'll excuse that word, and sociology. And we won't understand creativity, argues we, unless um, you pay attention to all of these different perspectives. Now, it may appear that I'm, a, I'm disappearing into an ivory tower. I hope that's not true. But this all comes together in a very brilliant scheme, I believe, that Csikszentmihalyi proposed about uh, seven or eight years ago. He said we shouldn't ask the question, what is creativity or who is creative? We should ask the question, where is creativity? And the answer is in this increasingly smudgy triangle. And what it says is you have to look at individual talents, you have to look at the domains in which these people work, and you have to look at the fields which make judgments. And creativity inheres in the dialectic or dialogue among these three nodes. So to be very concrete, let's assume that all of us are painters in New York City. I understand there are 200,000 people who call themselves artists in the greater New York area. And all of the individual talents, that's us in the bottom right, are being instructed by the domain. We're all learning how to paint by going to museums and taking painting courses and things like that. So the domain instructs us. We then all go to our atelier or studio or our back room and we paint. And the paintings we make are addressed to a field. And that's the experts. When we're younger, it's the people who admit us to painting school or art school. When we're somewhat older, it's the people who give us prizes or who buy our work or put it on display in a gallery. And a very few people who are selected by the field actually refashion the domain. Painting is different because of Picasso and Matisse and Miro and, and Pollock um, and O'Keefe and a few other people who actually really change the domain. So the next generation of people is instructed by a new domain. And if you say, well, painting is exotic and nobody can agree about that, so that's why you need a field, it's exactly the same in mathematics. There have to be expert people who judge. And in fact, by a wonderful coincidence, the best mathematician under the age of 40 is given an award called the Field Award. Uh, but it's no relation, as they say. <laughs> so um, that's the end of part two, a background of how we think about creativity. Enter the study that I conducted. I decided to see what would happen if we took a very careful look at seven individuals who were unambiguously very creative. And initially I thought I would take them from different eras, M Mozart, St. Augustine, people like that. But then I realized if there were differences among them, I wouldn't know whether it's because they were different or because they lived at very different times. So I decided to pick people who lived, so to speak, in the shadow of 1900 and who were influenced by Western Europe, whether or not they lived in Western Europe. And that very quickly constrained my sample quite a bit. And consistent with the um, theory of multiple intelligences to which Nikki alluded, I decided to take people who represented each of the seven intelligences, which for better or for worse, I believe is a better way of thinking about intelligence than there simply being one. So to remind you of the seven people, I will go through photographs of what they looked like when, we, when they were old and famous and Karsh took their picture, right? This is, this is Einstein, logical mathematical intelligence. Picasso, spatial intelligence. Stravinsky, musical intelligence. Eliot, linguistic. Graham, bodily kinesthetic. Now my kids think this is Ben Kingsley, but actually <laughs> <laughs> those of you who are over 30 know that it's, uh, it's uh, Gandhi. And this is, this is after he became Freud. So I decided to look at these seven people and to ask questions like, what traits apply to all of them? What descriptors, what laws, what nomos apply to all of them? Which ones apply to some of them? And which ones seem to apply just to individuals? 
And I did it through focus on the individual, focus on the domain, and focus on the field. So in a sense, I was putting the theory to work to see whether it could give us new insights about creativity. My method was biographical. I found out as much as I could about these people in a finite period of time. I relied heavily on secondary sources, but when they weren't enough, I went to primary sources. I focused particularly on the time of their greatest breakthrough, the time when they essentially did the thing which put their particular torque on the modern era. And while I was using the lens of individual domain and field, I was also on the lookout for surprises, what I call serendipitous findings. And in fact, I will conclude by mentioning five things which I hadn't expected to find. And in a sense, that's the reward for doing research. On the one hand, it's nice to find out what you hypothesize would be the case. But if you could solve all things in your own mind, there'd be no point in doing the research. So I was pleasantly surprised to discover some new things as well. Let me move on then to part four of the talk, which is, will be called, in the spirit of psychology journals, findings. I first want to give you a portrait of the, I called in the book EC, Exemplary Creator. And this is a, a prototype or an ideal type of what emerged by and large in the biographies of these seven individuals. To begin with, they did not, they were not born in big cities. By and large, they were born, use a technical term, in the boonies. Um, and in a sense, they became big fishes in little ponds. They came from homes which were boringly bourgeois, where the families were basically intact. They weren't wealthy, but they weren't starving. Hard work was extremely important. There was love, but it was often contingent upon doing work. But with one exception, there wasn't tremendous pressure on what kind of work that was done. It was um, Lutheran or Weberian Work was sort of good in its own, for its own purposes rather than um, that you had to do one thing or another. Indeed, when they felt a love relationship, in most cases it was with a, a nanny rather than with the, either of their biological parents. With one exception, they were not prodigies. Picasso was the exception. When they became 18, 19, 20, they all moved to the big city. Moreover, even though many of them been, had been kind of hermetic as kids, some of them had been sickly, they became gregarious and they found other people who were like them. They were almost like iron filings, they were magnetized. And even though often in the end they became isolates again and often rather negative and rejecting people, at that time they were gregarious and they were looking for people who were other young Turks and who were joining with them in a kind of rebellion. And this may be particularly true in around 1900 for, for reasons we could talk about. Having found friends and support group and so on, they were happier. However, the more they got into their own problematique and in their own domain, which they selected from a range of choices, but not from a whole palette of domains, they became more and more isolated, and they were more and more alone. Yet, as I will discuss later, at the time of their greatest breakthrough, which was typically their first one, um, they needed other people to support them. And this picture, while it doesn't apply to every figure in every specific, is surprisingly robust. It applies not only to these seven, but to many other people who I've looked at. Newton is an interesting exception. Newton doesn't seem quite to fit into that. But Newton is probably an exception in lots of, lots of, uh, lots of areas. The, the other thing that happened is that when they were doing this breakthrough work, in a sense, they were creating a new symbol system, a new way of ca capturing reality, one that nobody else, to their knowledge, had created before. And they then went through an operation where they were testing that symbol system to see whether it made sense to themselves and to other people. And at a certain point, and this was nothing they could do anything about, the symbol system kind of took on a life of its own. And that's when the, the field and the domain took it over. And whether they liked it or not, it, it belonged to the world it no longer belong to them. So that's a kind of a, you might say, a, 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 an, an exemplary portrait of what creative individuals around 1900 were like in, the, in, in their lives. 
What I want to do now is to take a look at the three nodes of the individual, the domain, and the field, and just throw out some representative findings. Of course, if you want to know all the findings, there's only possi one possible way in which you can do that. I was, of course, interested in the kinds of intelligences these people displayed. And you might say here, well, you know, you selected them for their intelligences, so you shouldn't be surprised to see that you, they had the intelligences that you said. But what was surprising is most of them were strong in more than one area. And except for Stravinsky, they all seemed to be weak in certain areas. And uh, I always perseverate on Freud here, because Freud was brilliant in language and brilliant in understanding human beings. He was not particularly good in spatial and mathematical thinking, and that was frustrating for him. And while he loved the visual arts and he loved um, drama, he couldn't stand music. His sister played the piano. Freud complained to his parents that he didn't like the noise of the piano, and so his parents got rid of the piano. It is no pleasure for me to give a talk where six out of my seven people are men and where most of the scientists I put on were men, but um, I think the only honest thing that I can say is that around the time I was studying, um, there were just very uneven opportunities for men and women in the traditional domains. And unless we look at other domains or at more recent times, we're going to find a very striking gender asymmetry. But that's at least one reason why. A number of people who are interested in creativity have played around with the, the number 10 years. But I think I've pushed it further than anybody else. We'll see whether I pushed it too far. It takes about 10 years for people to become expert in a domain, to be, even begin to be able to do something that's new. And then it takes up to another 10 years before people really have a breakthrough and do something that's strikingly new. What I found fascinating is it took about 10 years thereafter for people to have subsequent breakthroughs. And in many cases, this happened at decade intervals. And people like Picasso and Stravinsky and Graham, who had long lives and worked in the arts, kept doing original things for every decade. I mean, it's possible that if Graham had lived to 150, she would still have choreographed new dances. Less so in the pure sciences. Einstein's last years were not rewarded with scientific breakthroughs. And Eliot was kind of a funny case. He stopped writing poetry when he was young, but he did have um, creative lives in other areas. Now, this is what I call a hand-waving slide. There's no way you can possibly understand each of the uh, you know, 20 or 30 items I have written in here. But I do believe that there is something about 10 years. What isn't clear is whether it takes that long to kind of re-scramble your brain, come up with a whole new set of connections, if I can use a current jargon, or whether it's something about the field. The field can't adopt new ideas more than every 10 years because it takes that long for people to adopt, to, to, to catch on. But anyway, the 10-year rule at least seems worth taking seriously. The people who I studied had different kinds of minds. I've already told you they had different intelligences, and later, as I will tell you, they did different kinds of creative things. It surprised me the extent to which, given their different thinking, how similar they were as human beings. And to talk about two aspects of them which were not terribly praiseworthy is they were all self-promoters, which ranged from Einstein, who did some self-promotion, but not a lot. I would be inclined to move Picasso over. I, when I wrote the book, I had him a little bit further in the left, but I'd kind of move him over toward the center. And then people like Freud and Gandhi, you know, devoted at least as much time promoting themselves, though you might like a nicer word for that. Then, I mean, when, when Gandhi planned a fast, he made sure that all the telegraphs were working, because he wanted everybody in the world to know he was fasting. That was a very important part of what he did. And when I was young and naive, I thought people did things and they were just discovered. That's not what happens to these folks. Either they promote themselves or they have a mother or a mentor or a Huxley in the case of Darwin or a huckster in the case of others who promotes them. <laughs> Even less appealingly, as these people got older, they were simply not very nice people. And they ranged from kind of disregard for others to frank sadism on the part of Picasso. And it's very interesting to speculate why this is so. I think it's probably multi-determined. And I don't think if you'd met them as 20, at age 20, you would have thought they were um, terrible people. But when I talked about this stuff in England, one of the newspapers ran a headline which said, um, 
Einstein equals genius minus niceness. And uh, it's all too true about these people. They were also, and perhaps it goes without saying, ambitious, hardworking, increasingly thick-skinned as they got older, um, and always raising the ante on themselves. They were never content just to be accepted. They always wanted to challenge themselves more. In fact, when uh, Freud and Jung came to America in 1909, trip's first, Freud's first and only trip to America, he couldn't stand the place, um, Freud went right back to Vienna and cursed the Americans out, but Jung, who was more of a man about town, toured the East Coast and had a great old time, and he wired Freud, and he said, Dear Freud, this is when they were still talking to each other, wonderful news, psychoanalysis, tremendous success, and Freud wired back immediately, what did you leave out? <laughs> Freud was not happy being accepted, at least, without a at least not without a struggle. He was always pushing the ante, and these people were like that. They, they didn't want easy victories. Let me comment a bit now about th these individuals vis-a-vis the domain in the field. Whereas the people were quite similar in personalities, they had quite different relationships to the domain and to the field. The domain, remember, is the discipline or craft where people do their work. In some cases, like Picasso, Picasso worked in a perfectly established domain, painting, but he created some new genre within painting. Similarly, Einstein worked in a perfectly established domain, physics, but he created what Thomas Kuhn would call a new paradigm in physics. This is different from someone like Freud, who flitted from one profession to the other. He, he had 10 different kinds of professions, beginning with um, doing neurology and neuroanatomy through, uh, through psychiatry, pedi pediatric neurology, and so on, until he finally created a new domain, psychoanalysis, one that hadn't existed before. And of course, he easily became king of the hill in that particular domain. And uh, modern dance was also a domain which didn't really exist until Martha Graham and a few other people invented it. And it's interesting in looking at that history, which I did go back and look at the original sources of, how important the newspaper critics in New York were in creating that domain. Because there was no people who wrote about, there were no people who wrote about dance until then. People who wrote about dance were either the sports people or the entertainment people. But certain people around 1930, when Martha Graham got going, said, this is, this is so important that we have to cover it. And in effect, they said, we have to help make it exist. And they did with, of course, uh, the cooperation people like uh, Doris Humphrey and, and Martha Graham and, and certain others. And I would claim that Gandhi also invented a domain, the domain of, of nonviolent resistance, which has influenced people like Martin Luther King and uh, people Chinese in Tiananmen Square and others of this century, may even have had more influence since Gandhi died outside of India than in India. There are also quite instructive differences when it comes to the field. Remember, the field are the people who make decisions about whether your stuff is any good. Freud's problem was that he knew he was a genius, but nobody else realized it. And so Freud kept looking for a field that could recognize him and finally, he not only created a domain, but he created a field too. He analyzed people, and they became his field. And you know, um, people in psychoanalysis to this day can trace their analysts all the way back to, to Freud, because he was, as Eric Erickson said, the first psychoanalyst. Einstein, the field, was about three people. When I was a kid, actually, on the bubblegum cards, it used to say, how many people understand Einstein's theory, and you turned it over and it said 12. And uh, um, if, t if it was Time Magazine, they would have listed who they were. Um, by that time, it, that was nonsense. But in fact, if Max Planck, who was the editor of the Annalen in their physic, and a few other people thought what Einstein said was important, it was important. Um, this is very different from people who have to essentially address a mass audience. Artists have to address an elite, or nowadays more and more a mass audience. And people like Gandhi and Freud eventually built up quite large organizations, which became their field. So, um, the, the whole question of how individuals find the domain and then twist it in new ways, or even create it if it isn't there, and then how they either respond to fields that already exist or create their own fields, as people like Gandhi and Freud did, is a, is a fascinating one, which nobody, including me, has begun to to tap. Okay, well, we're doing pretty well on time, anyway. What I want to do now is to 
tell you about five things which I didn't expect to find, summarize my talk, and then answer those questions which I promised that I would answer. When I began the study, I, like almost everybody else in the area, thought that even if there were different kinds of creativities and different kinds of intelligences, that basically all creative individuals were doing the same kind of thing, that basically that they were, they were solving problems. But I eventually concluded that there are at least five different kinds of creative activities. I'm going to run through them, and people often ask me after my talks, well, what are the implications for education of this? And I could talk about that afterwards, but one implication is if you're a teacher or a somebody else involved in education, don't look just for people who are good at solving problems that you give to them in a creative way. That's the mistake that I think psychometrics has made. Solving problems is one, one kind of creativity, and both Freud and Einstein did solve problems. Watson and Crick solved a very famous problem. What's the structure of DNA? And they were racing with other people to do it. But there are at least four other things which creative people do, and different creative people do different ones of these. One thing they do is to develop a general conceptual scheme a new way of thinking about reality, physical reality, or if, in their, if they're in the social sciences, uh, human reality. And uh, I would say both Freud's work and Einstein's work are better described as being the development of a generative new conceptual scheme than of, than of solving problems. A third kind of thing that people do, particularly in the arts, is they create a permanent work in a genre either a genre that already exists, like painting, symphony, choreography, or they create a new kind of genre. Um, Picasso invented collage and papier collé with Brock, and then people could create in that genre. That's a third kind of creativity. The last two were the most surprising to me, um, and I think they're very important. One is to stage a stylized performance. That means you go in front of an audience and you perform. Martha Graham only felt that she was alive when she was performing. And she performed way too long as a result. When she stopped performing, unfortunately for her, she had 25 years left of living. She was a very good choreographer, but she basically felt dead once she couldn't dance anymore. And like many of the first generation of modern dancers, she didn't like to be filmed. And there are very, very few films and videotapes of Martha Graham. And the reason was, among other things, that those people felt that you had to have been there. And it had to be remembered by what you saw at the moment. And somehow to see a kinescope or a videotape would, would ruin it and dilute it. So that's the kind of realization. Tonight when I got here, um, I hadn't had a chance to see my slides. And I got tremendous resistance from the very good personnel here about going out to look at my slide because there were already people coming in the audience. And it was clear that they were confusing me with the performer. Because a performer isn't somebody who would come out beforehand to look at his slides when there are people in the audience. It destroys the effect. But basically, I'm a professor, for better or for worse. So that's not how, I mean, I love you all, but it's not how, that's not my area of, of creativity. But for many people, it is. The last kind of performance is a high-stake performance. This is where, as Groucho Marx used to say, you bet your life. And uh, when Gandhi went into a campaign where he fasted, or well, he stood in front of people with no weapons on himself when they had weapons. He was betting his life on that performance. Again, these are kinds of creativity which people like me who sit in their study and scribble all the time and occasionally interview somebody may be insensitive to, but they're very important. Obviously, in the real world, a lot depends upon performance. In fact, Woody Allen says 80% of life is showing up. And I think he's right, but the other 20% is performance, and we've got to have some people who are good performers. Next finding. I had thought that these folks would all be prodigies. In fact, the only one who was a prodigy was Picasso. And John Richardson, in his book about, P about Picasso, claims he wasn't a Picasso. Well, he, well, he wasn't, sorry. He, he was Pablo. He wasn't Picasso. He wasn't a prodigy yet. A few people who are prodigies go on to be adult creators, Picasso and Mozart being the most famous. There are lots of people who are prodigies, usually in music, math, or chess, or sometimes the visual arts, who don't become adult creators. My masters of the modern era were not prodigies, though some of them were psychometrically smart when they were young, some of them weren't. Um, alas, there's this last category of most persons. Um, <laughs> but here's my, here's my hypothesis. The prodigy has the domain given to him or her. 
There's no way that Bobby Fischer could be denied chess or that Mozart could be denied music. They announced it to the world. However, a prodigy makes his or her way initially by doing exactly what the domain is doing at the time. They become total experts. If they want to become creative, at a certain point they have to reject the tradition. They have to step on their father's face, which is what Mozart and Picasso both did. It's very painful. Or their teacher's f um, feet. They have to construct a different kind of personality, one that isn't compliant but defiant. And that's very draining. The opposite happens for the non-prodigy creator. That person first develops a personality, hardworking, tough-skinned, energetic, ambitious, willing to give up a lot for work. That person then selects a domain, but they don't go into the course catalog or into the um, strong vocational guide and choose a domain at random. They choose it from constrained options. Of my folks, Freud is probably the only one who could have been any kind of a scholar. Eliot could have been any kind of a humanistic scholar. He could not have been a scientist. None of the other ones could have been a scholar. And it goes on from there. They select, but from a limited set of options. So that's um, the next surprise. The third thing I've already alluded to, and it was really a complete shock to me, when these people begin to do their most creative work, they're very much alone because they're really doing things nobody has ever done before. It turns out that they desperately need to have somebody to support them at that time. They need someone to provide cognitive support to say, I may not understand everything, but what you're doing is making sense. And they need somebody to love them, someone to say, you're OK, Siggy or Albert or Pablo. And some of these support people are very famous, at least to their biographers, Picasso with Brock, Stravinsky with the Diaghilev Circle. With Freud, there's a man named Fleece who would be totally obscure, except Freud wrote to him every day for 10 years. And Fleece had a totally cock and nanny theory about how um, the secret of life lay in the nose and in numbers, with 23 being the most important number. But he and Freud each told one another they were okay, and this was tremendously important to Freud. And Freud dropped them almost instantly and burned his letters, which is why we have Freud's letters to Fleece, um, but not vice versa. He was happy to, you know, to rewrite history after it was over. So the need for cognitive and effective, effective support at the time the greatest breakthrough is important and has real implications for anybody who is around a highly creative individual. At that moment, and here's about as psychoanalytic as I ever get, there seems to be a kind of a replay of very early relations in a person's life, but the roles are reversed. Instead of having the mother introduce the child to the language and symbols of the world, which are completely new for the child, the creator introduces a new language that he or she has created to other people, either to someone who they treat as a child or someone they treat as a peer. And uh, from a developmental point of view, they're playing upon a very early relations, but they're doing role reversals as a way of essentially introducing new ideas into the world. And the final point is that um, by the time these people are into middle life, they have formed what I call a Faustian bargain, a bargain where essentially they give everything for their work. And they're ascetic. Sometimes they're ascetic, ascetic and sadistic, but basically nothing counts except for getting the work done. This is very hard on the people who are around them. And there is an unfortunate amount of carnage, including suicides and breakdowns, around the people who are highly creative. One could become very angry at them for that, but it may just be that it comes with the territory, that the demands and the pressures on them are so great and they're operating on such a thin line or wire that they really cannot have, they have no, they have no margin of charity for anything else. Um, the Romans had a phrase, libri o libri, books or children. It's succinct. These people live through their work. Yeats said, perfection in the life or perfection in the work. These people all chose to have perfection in their work. Um, Actually, I got a letter the other day from somebody, a person who I like, who's reasonably creative, and the person thanked me for the book saying, this is 
two, one of the two most important books I've ever read, in my li ever read in my life because it explained myself to me. And I said, well, you know, this person does have the hubris that comes from being highly creative because he said, um, I, have, I struck that same kind of Faustian bargain. Um, so there may be some false positives in the, uh, in the, in the sample. <laughs> anyway, those are, my, uh, th those are my five surprising findings. So let, let me summarize and conclude. These people have wonderful minds, but their minds are very different from one another. The kinds of intelligences they each have are different, and that determines the domains they choose and the kind of work they do in these domains. That being said, it's surprising that at least these people have quite similar personalities in many regards. The hardworking, ambitious, increasingly selfish, or at least self-centered approach seems to be a hallmark, hallmark of these individuals um, in, as they get older. They all have that time where they need, on the one hand, to be alone, to work things out, but they also need to have support. And then they begin this interesting ballet with the domain in the field where they want to be accepted, um, and they hope they will be, but eventually it, be it falls out of their hands because the, the field and the domain take their work and run with it, and often it goes in directions which they can't control, which may be one reason why they want to keep on doing new things because they want to regain that kind of control of, of their own ideas. Finally, I, I want to say in summary, and here again I think we have an interesting implication for the rest of us and for education, is that these people didn't come from crazy households and they didn't spend their childhood simply gazing at the stars. They worked hard, they acquired discipline, they mastered a domain. And mastering a domain probably takes on the average about 10 years. And people often say to me, you know, can they be creative and uh, will they be creative people like these giants of a century ago? And one of the things I think of is that if we lose that kind of bourgeois ethic, it's much less likely. And these people came from a time when that was something that was expected, at least in the kinds of uh, um, petit, petty bourgeois households in which they grew up. Okay, to conclude, first question is, um, well, let me raise, before I get to the very conclusion, let me, let me just raise a couple of questions which may be on your mind. One is, how representative are these people of creative individuals in general? Well, I would say that they are probably very representative of creative individuals who live in an era where the creativity is revolutionary. And 1900 was such a time. People were on the lookout for really um, pattern-breaking sorts of things. That's not the story of every time, nor is it the story of every society. China, for example, features what I would call evolutionary rather than revolutionary creativity, except interestingly enough in politics, which is the one area where the United States has a fairly evolutionary system, and in China it's pretty revolutionary. But when it comes to other domains, we in this century have looked for revolution, whereas they over the centuries have looked for evolution. Certainly, we have to increase the sample beyond seven. And certainly as time goes on, we want people from who aren't all, as the saying goes, dead white males. But I had to play the deck that was dealt me. Um, another thing which is very interesting is that all these people seem to regain, seem to retain an access to their childhood. And I think that's a characteristic of creative individuals in general. But perhaps creative individuals in different eras have access to different aspects of their childhood. And these people seem to have access to the first years of life um, and seem to be able to think very much the way a five-year-old does while at the same time having the domain and discipline control that only somebody who's mastered a domain can, can do. You might say, as some people have said, well, is this just success? And I would say th that when the field accepts you right away, it may be success. But it takes time to know whether it's also creativity. Now, let's take Madonna, something which I hope you will do. Um, it's clear that Madonna is very successful. It's not really clear whether she's creative, nor if she is, whether, what domain she's creative in. Um, that would take, that would take uh, uh, I mean that with all due respect. Uh, um, it takes a passage of time, which is why I studied people who I think where the dust had more or less settled. Okay, at last, how to become creative. My belief is that by the age of the people who are in this audience, there's not much you can do about your biology, about your brain and your genetics, and there isn't a heck of a lot you can do about your mind. Your intelligences have developed pretty well, your personality has developed pretty well, and I hope I you won't just become mean, which seems to be uh, one of the characteristics of these people. <laughs> um, 
But studying the domain in the field can be very instructive. Having a sense of where the domain is now, but rather than just copying where people are now, trying to project where it can, it's going to go 10 or 20 or 30 years from now is, I think, something that creative people spend a lot of time thinking about. By the same token, there may be one out of 1,000 people who is just discovered by the field and apotheosized without their doing anything. But that's not usually the way it happens. These people, even people like Einstein, are very aware of how the field works, who the decision makers are, how to get and hold their attention, how to remain on good terms with them. At the same time, people like Eliot and Picasso were being absolute bastards to people around them. They knew how to be sycophants. And Stravinsky was probably the worst, um, you know, would sue people in the morning and love them in the afternoon because they knew it was very, very important to keep the right people in the field happy. So at the risk of recommending that you be a bit manipulative, let me say that attending to the domain, attending to the field, is nothing to be embarrassed by. It's a characteristic of creative individuals. OK, finally, for the pièce de résistance, are you creative? Well, this is one of the bad news, good news kinds of questions. Um, the bad news is the field can be very slow. And so you might actually die without knowing <laughs> that you're creative. But the good news is, because the field is slow, you'll never know for sure that you're not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if we could turn on the lights now, I'd be happy to take uh, some questions or comments from psychometricians and others in the, in the audience. Okay. Oh, you, you, you. I, d I missed the very large. For taking the different capacities and what? Oh, for unique blend. Um, Right. Well, th this, this question is that I, I've never been asked this question before. It's a, it sounds more like a New York, it's, it has a little New Yorker cartoon characteristic. Did I take the corpus callosum into account? But it's a serious question. The corpus callosum is the band of fibers which uh, connect uh, the two hemispheres. It's become famous mostly to us non-neuroanatomists because when people have their brains split, what is cut is the corpus callosum. So the two hemispheres no longer communicate to one another. And... Um, Therefore, you can test each hemisphere in isolation. My reason for interest in neurobiology is because that field is changing so quickly that there's no question we will soon have good in vivo studies of the nervous systems of highly creative individuals. And not just after they die, but when they're actually alive through things like PET scans. One of the things which people who study creativity and your question presupposes that you know this, have speculated is that creative people have a lot of conversation going on in different parts of the brain. Um, to the extent that's true, it means connecting fibers and transmitting fibers might be more active. So I've actually been trying to encourage some folks at Harvard to look at highly gifted and highly creative people, those are not the same thing, in terms of their ongoing brain processes. And while I've never put the corpus callosum question to them. I think that's something that the people who know a lot more about it than I would want to. So all I can say is that's an interesting hypothesis. It might well be true. There's some extremely soft evidence that suggests that when creative people are doing the kinds of things that I describe in creativity tests, there's a lot of stuff going on in different parts of the brain. But that doesn't really speak directly to your question. Right. Yes, and the gentleman in the front. You, re you mean regu regularity? Well, I was just trying to figure out which part of my definition. Yeah, right. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked because it, it gives me a chance to say what I meant by regularity. There is a, a kind of a common, um, you might say, folk wisdom about creative individuals that 
they just kind of sit around and wait for inspiration to strike. And it strikes people every once in a while, but it might never strike again. By and large, when you look at creative individuals, you find out they have what Howard Gruber calls a network of enterprises. They're engaged in many different kinds of activity, not just one. And rather than having a simp an explosion once or twice, they have lots of mini explosions, mini turbulences, which in the cases of my people, add up to finally a, a maximum explosion. Um, but idea they're thinking about ideas all the time. It's very important for them to do that. Freud said, when ideas don't come to me, I go halfway to meet them. And you might say that their principal activity in life is being creative, though they probably would reject that description if it came from someone like me. Um, but they, they try to devise their lives, their homes, their offices, their summer vacations, all in efforts to recreate the situations where they can become creative. And they have projects and they keep notebooks. Everybody, all of my people kept notebooks. And it's, it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's, it, you know, they could put down on, you know, on the passport when they ask you occupation, they could write down creator because that's what they're really into. And there are a few people like Leonardo who do it in a number of different domains, but most people are very happy if they can do it in one domain. So to, to get to your, your question, um, creative people don't solve a problem once, they're regular problem solvers, and when they've come up with a scheme, if it's as powerful as Darwin's theory of evolution, they spend the rest of their life exploring implications of it in more and more different um, areas, or if they're like many Nobel Prize winners who've done it in the hard science, they then they go to biology, and then they slum in psychology, and then maybe they write poetry. That's sort of the, never, never, works, the, never works the other way. Um, except among novelists, you almost never have the situation of somebody having created one remarkable work. And with novelists, it's often the story of a person's life. If a person has a fascinating enough story and they can write reasonably well, they'll have one very successful book. But unless they either have other stories they can tell or they can tell their story in another way, that's about all. And somebody even wrote a book about a few people, American authors. I think the author of Rain Tree Country and somebody else who had only one book that really erupted. Yes, two folks over there, one gentleman in the aisle, yeah. Well, I didn't say unhappy. Um, in fact, I think that uh, at least some of them were happy some of the time, which is about the most any of us can expect. Um, also, to use one of Chick and Mahai's terms, it's clear that what made them happy was their work, and they tried to, they were living for what is often called the periods of flow, when they lost complete track of everything else and just became so immersed in the problem space. And this, for them, even if they were unhappy most of the time, if you said to them, well, why do you stay at your desk? Why don't you go away? They wouldn't hear of it. Um, because for them, that really was living to do, to do, that, to do that work. Um, it's very hard to compare people's happiness and unhappiness. I don't really know how, how, how to do it. Hmm? Um, yeah, um, I'm a little bit, uh, I just looked up there. See, Einstein's name is right in the center. I guess he's, he's, look, he's looking at us. Um, uh, I, I would hate to be thinking that I'm committing what's called pathography, which is to look for the, the, uh, you know, the bad in people. What, what I would like you to take away from this is whether or not these people had any sadistic streak in them, and I think some did and some didn't, that the older they got, they got the more their work was all-consuming. And that means that people who had expectations from them, particularly affective expectations, that they would reciprocate love, that they would try to help you and so on, were destined to be disappointed. Um, this doesn't mean that, that they were all capable of surprising you and doing things that were altruistic. But if you look, for example, at their children, at their wives, even people like Gandhi, whose stock and trade was being a wonderful human being to the mass, or Einstein, who wrote wonderful philosophical things, they just didn't have relationships with those people. And in fact, Gandhi says something which is absolutely remarkable, most remarkable because he didn't realize the irony. He said of somebody, well, why should he care about his children? He's involved in something so much more important. Now, can you imagine most of us saying that, even if we thought it, but that, but that, but that, uh, that, 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 that Gandhi would have said that without a sense of irony tells you the kind of weight these people have on their shoulders 
and the corners that they cut to be able to continue. And, and I think most of us really do have trouble empathizing with that. And I don't empathize in the sense of, of, of liking it, but I do empathize in, in the sense of saying that that may a price be a price that you pay. But the meanest thing which the, the newspaper took was, was I think, a, was rougher than that word I would have used. There was another question. Yeah. Which, of course, are always reliable. Uh, well, the honest answer is that, that I'm, not a, I'm not a biographer. I'm a, a social scientist looking for generalizations. And I could have spent my whole life on any one of these individuals. As it was, the project took me about seven years. It would be mistaken to say I spend a year in each person. But what I tried to do was to find out, to read the best biographies of them and to try to get a feeling for their lives, and then to focus on their moment of breakthrough. And the people I selected all left um, manuscripts. So I studied Eliot's manuscripts for the wasteland. I tried desperately to reprint them in the book. That was the only rejection I got. Mrs. Eliot would not let me do it. I looked at Stravinsky's Rite of Spring sketchbook, Picasso's sketches for Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, some of which are now at the, at the new Museum of Modern Art. They weren't on display before, but they are now. Um, Guernica and so on. So, um, I mean, the reason was partly my expertise, or lack thereof, partly my time, but also I wanted to save the, the primary source research for things where I really felt I had to form my own opinions. And I don't know that I came up with anything original, but consistent with what you're saying, at least I felt more confident about those objections. And to be brutally honest with you, I stopped reading biographies when they became completely redundant. The truth is, if any of you have ever done a biography, after you've read them all, not only do you know the, the, the sort of the standard story, but you know whose story is being repeated all the time. And you see when misspellings go from one biography to another, and so on. So it's, even that isn't, uh, uh, well, you get the point. Yes, uh, first the woman, then the man in the middle. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, the question was, why didn't I talk more about curiosity? And could I um, attribute a lot of these individuals, a lot of what these individuals accomplished to their curiosity? Do I, do I have your question correct? Yeah. Well, certainly, um, I would um, assent to that general description, which wasn't present in psychology 50 years ago, which I think more people in, in psychology accept today. And I would go on to say, though I didn't write about it in the book, that I think these people as kids were, were very curious, some of them about everything, but some like Einstein had no curiosity at all about the human world, but a great deal of curiosity about the world, world of objects. The, the curiosity at a certain point either gets yoked or doesn't get yoked to a particular discipline or domain. I think if it doesn't, then people become kind of, they do well in creativity tests, but they don't, uh, they don't accomplish anything. And if you want to be this kind of creator, eventually it has to be socialized in the sense that you do have to care about what other people think and how they make value judgments. This doesn't mean, let me stress, that these people tried to accommodate, because they didn't. They were very single-minded, and they did what they wanted to but they were not blind to what other people thought. And we all know people who do wonderful things, and we love being around them, and they have a great old time, um, but in a sense, they're not, um, they're not taking the risk in the public kind of chance that these people are. Somebody once said it isn't science if it's, if it's not written, and I think that's true. Science isn't having a great idea. It's writing about that great idea and letting other people throw darts at it. And these people all made themselves vulnerable in that sense. And that's quite different from curiosity. In fact, uh, it, one of the things that happens when you're curious is you get slapped if you get curious about things you shouldn't. I mean, a lot of us grew up in childhood getting slapped a lot because we're poking our noses where we shouldn't. How do you handle that? And that's where that tough-skinnedness comes in. And that's, again, where parenting is very important. Um, 
These people had parents or teachers who helped them to cope with failure as well as success. Because everybody fails sometimes when they're young. And you need to have a story to tell so you don't feel defeated. And these people had folks around them, either teachers or mentors or siblings or parents, who helped them feel okay about themselves even when things didn't go well, as well as pushing them onward when they were at a plateau. And so that's, that's not the same as curiosity. So I guess um, I accept your point, but I think if you want to play in the public arena, it's a much more complex set of um, properties around than, than curiosity. And curiosity, we would like to think, is an innate human property, but it's one that's very easily squelched. And one point that I could make about creativity of the sort I've just studied, it's really a modern Western phenomena. In most societies throughout most of history, we kill people who do things that go against the convention. And there are lots of reasons for that. And so curiosity gets domesticized very quickly in most cultures because it seemed to be to run, to, to run against the, uh, the, the cultural fabric. And William James was one of many people to point out that the brighter the flame of a certain era, the more quickly it gets doused. So you look at Athens in the 5th century, Florence in the 15th century, New York for that matter in the early 1900s. These are places of incredible creativity, but it doesn't last that long. Perhaps in the sense that Vienna around 1900, the society can't, can't take it. I wandered a bit. Yes, uh, you want to continue that for a second? Oh yeah, oh, yeah uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, somebody, maybe it's you, has just coined the phrase simultalent. Is that you? Oh, that's down here. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> um, there certainly are examples of people who have had two or even three areas of strength. Um, it's not the norm. Whether it's not the norm because life is short, and if we could live to be 900, we, there are people who could do it in awe, we simply don't know. Uh, my theory of multiple intelligences holds at the very least that strength in one area is no guarantor of strength in other areas. We know that Churchill was a masterful leader, and my publisher will be very angry if I don't say my next book is on leadership, um, and Churchill's one of the people I'll be writing about. He was a very good writer. In fact, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I didn't realize that. Um, as a painter, there's no reason to know that he would ever been more than a, than a Sunday painter. Einstein loved to play an instrument. Um, the violin, but there's no record that he was particularly good. So we need to distinguish between people who have multiple interests, which is wonderful, and people who really make marks across domains. Leonardo, who I think you meant, um, is very unusual, and he actually made contributions to a number of domains. And the more culture evolves, the more difficult that is, because um, you know nowadays you probably couldn't be a world-class scientist and world-class artist because the domains are too differentiated. Okay, gentlemen in the, in the middle there, yeah. Well, the field makes lots of mistakes. Uh, and uh, it's very bad for fields to be too ingrained. I mean, fields used to ignore everything that was done by women, it, you know, and often by other groups as well. And that's a very, uh, very, very bad kind of thing. This does not lead me to the conclusion that it leads many postmodernists to, to wit that quality is all just prejudice and bias. I would not be able to live if I thought that that was all there was to it. What I do believe is that over time, while there may be some people who do wonderful things which are never recognized because life isn't fair, the people who are, who canonized in the way that the people are, that I studied, are people who really did discover something new about the world. Either the world outside, which is what 
scientists basically do, or the world of experience, which is what I think artists do. And in that sense, I do have faith in the field, but I completely agree it can be quite myopic in the short run, and, and, the, and the examples like the San Diego Zoo are, are, salut are very salutary for that reason. Well, why don't we take, uh, I see a lot of hands. What I'm going to do, though, I think is just take one more talk, one more from the audience, maybe a uh, gentleman with a cap back there, but I will hang around for a while if people have other questions. I'll try to answer them. Yeah? Well, the, the truth is that I'm not at all an expert in either of those topics, so I can only give you very secondary source answers to that. It does happen, and I think I mentioned this in the book, but I don't make anything of it at all because I feel so uncomfortable with it, that six out of my seven people did have some kind of a breakdown, some kind of an exhaustion around the time of their most important work. This is a chicken-egg question. We don't know whether they were that kind of people or whether anybody would have that kind of breakdown when they were working with the kind of intensity that they did. As you may well know, a spate of books have recently come out, a spate of books has recently come out, about the relationships between certain kinds of um, problems, particularly manic depressive disease, and certain kinds of creativity, particularly in writers. Kay Redfield Jameson has written a book on that topic, and there are other books and articles as well. Uh, I think it's it's not at all unreasonable that there may be some connections between individuals who have tremendous mood cycles and what, are the, what it is that allows you to enter into imaginative worlds and to pour out work and things like that. But I would fall very far short of saying that it's either necessary nor sufficient. There are certainly many people who are highly creative who do not have any documented um, disorders. And alas, there are many, many people who have all kinds of documented disorders who aren't uh, creative in the slightest. As for the use of, of, of drugs and other kinds of uh, mind-altering devices, that seems to be tied to certain eras and to certain subcultures. Again, there are, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of people for whom there's no evidence of substance abuse. In fact, Eliot would not take chocolate till he was 70. He was such an ascetic. And several of my people gave up sex in their 30s. Um, so, the, you know, the, res the reliance on... Freud wouldn't even take aspirin um, until he had some operations for cancer. So, but he, of course, he did take cocaine when he was young. Uh, uh, so the, the answer is the evidence is accumulating. I think there's, en there's enough now to make a case for writers in manic depressive disease. But uh, certainly, I wouldn't recommend if you want to be creative that you'd go either of those routes. I would say work for 10 years and pray. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.